Well, good morning, all y'all. It's 10 o'clock and it's Lancaster Wood Turner's Weekly Coffee Hour number 195, March 28th, 2024. Uh, my name is John Kelsey. I'll be your moderator as usual. I'm seeing a smaller crowd than usual, 27 on screen so far. Um, I forgot to send the email this week, you know, moron. Um, but it's the same link every week and I, I guess people are slowly figuring that out. Um, I, I'll, I'll be better after this. Whereas I was saying earlier, before we go on, we, we are also catching up on editing the videos, thanks to uh, Ziegler, John Ziegler, who's been going through them after I post them to write the descriptions. I, I found of just that part, for me being a second or third time through the thing to be an onerous burden. And that's why I quit editing back in December. It was just, oh, I just don't want to do this anymore. Uh, but the editing part is the video editing part is easy it's and i used to write for a living and maybe that's it you know nobody's paying me i don't want to write anything <laughs> i can help it <laughs> so, and we can all I, chip a quarter in <laughs> right i just prefer to edit video and work with pictures these days and that uh, maybe it's this in a creeping dementia who knows what it is um I see a couple hands up. I, I invite more. I have a, a, a small raft of stuff. I don't know how long it'll take, but I'm going to go over to it in, in, in just a second. Uh, Lancaster Club meeting is next uh, Tuesday night. Um, if you're a player in the Amstrak uh, adventure, it's time to get your work into to either the club space on Tuesday or to me in advance. I have about, well, maybe more than a dozen boxes of uh, finely crafted lathe work, uh, lathe art downstairs, right? In my living room and a little hand truck so i can get them out to my wife's larger car so we'll be delivering logs uh lots of turnings and the boxes which you'll see on the that i'm going to show you in in, in just a second the following saturday is uh second saturday after that is open shop i forget exactly what the date is 14th or 13th maybe 14th uh so that's a uh, lancaster club events um, I'm going to, while I have the floor, I'm going to hold the floor for a minute. I'm going to show you a few things over here. But first, I have to kill my background. I can't shh, can't do this maneuver with my background on. But hang on a second here. Use virtual background. None. Okay. Don't worry. This part will be edited out. <laughs> Probably not. I've, I've gotten a whole lot looser about all that these days. Uh, but are you seeing this one now? This is a... Uh, I'm going to show some images that have just piled up over here in, in the order that they are, and uh, we'll see if I can do that accurately. Uh, this is Matt Kilareski's drawing for making the risers that we're going to use in the Amtrak uh, layout. Can you guys all see that? Yep. yep. You all good? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, we decided we wanted to have a way of separating the work, so we, uh, we divided the, each of the cases into uh, really 14 spots. Uh, and Matt laid this out and uh, I, I took the overall measurements. He did the detail measurements and then, uh, oh, come on there. Barry made the boxes out of uh, a, a cheap ply he knows about that's quite flat. Uh, so these are lightweight. I think the ply is 3 16th. Um, and this, here's, here's one set and there's another set across the shop in this picture. That's Barry with Rick Atkins in his uh, excellent shop. Barry's shop is a, Furniture makers, table shop, the centered workshop with a lathe annex off to the side. So it's a really a good shop. Uh, this is the scrap left from five sheets of that plywood. I mean, this turned out to be a very efficient layout. Uh, this is Rick Atkins uh, spraying the boxes in his shop. Rick, Rick operates uh, house washing and uh, deck repair and uh, log house cleanup company. Uh, but he's got an enormous facility in Leola, and he, uh, and when I go there to visit, it seems like most of it's devoted to his hobbies, uh, because they don't do much in the wintertime. You can't spray houses in the winter, so Rick has got the winter to play in this very large facility. Uh, anyway, he set up to spray paint the 22 boxes that Barry made, and this is uh, hit Rick in the middle of it. It's, he's using an airless uh, sprayer, working straight out of the gallon can. Uh, I wore my N95 mask. Uh, Rick says he does this a lot. He, he very quickly set the posts on the sawhorses to make an easel so they, they could be sprayed. And they're a flat, uh, sort of an eggshell white. It's a nice finish. Um, I think they've got two coats. I was, went over and helped him sand in between. So there you go. Um, this is, oh yeah, Holly Ann Nickham. I remember Holly Ann Nickham, um, who 
I've never actually met, but she's going to drop her work off today. And she also wants to know if she can get some help with their Grizzly G0835 lathe, which is knocking at anything over 300. They want to change the bearings. Uh, they suspect it's a bearing issue and they want anybody that has any experience with that. So if anybody's got Grizzly lathe bearing experience, um, I'll get you in touch with Holly Ann if you don't pick her email up off of this. Uh, anybody got any 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 wave your hand if you want you can step up to this one anybody just one comment grizzly will help her out if she calls the service people they'll walk her right through how to do it that's exactly what i'm going to tell her thanks I, that was my experience with my old grizzly equipment as well uh well there's a bunch of chair spin, spindles that one of our regulars uh henriksen bob henriksen um, is making right now he's doing a chair making workshop somewhere down in tennessee which is why he's not here today um, I'm going to read a letter from him in a minute when it comes up, but uh, he's he's working on Windsor chairs. He's been working with a mentor. He didn't say who it is. I, I don't know. Uh, I know that Drew Langsner lives down that way, but I don't know who these are. Who's Anyway, these are for a bunch of Windsor chairs, and I just love the turning on these chairs. I have several of them in my house from various makers. Uh, anyway, that's what Henriksen's up to, so that's why he's not here today to speak for himself. And what he... Uh, <laughs> Okay, I'm going to paraphrase it because I can't read it on my screen unless I can do this. Yeah. Uh, I said last week that Derek Weidman turns uh, using a vacuum chuck. Henriksen has taken a number of workshops with Weidman and says that's absolutely not true. He always turns between centers because the objects are often very far out around. And if they're not held between centers, it's just way too dangerous. Um, so he's really good at that. And he uses slip centers. So it's... Uh, the work stops turning instead of catching on the tool when you, you really have to turn with a light, delicate touch. He's turning a lot of air. Um, and when Henriksen comes back um, in a week or two, we'll get him to talk to this some more. But I just did want to offer that correction up that because uh, I misled you on that a couple weeks ago. Uh, wait a minute, I just killed the slideshow. No, you didn't. No, I didn't. I want another place I want to go. I want to go into here now. I'm going to show you a little video, I think, if I can uh, find it here. Yeah. I can make this full screen. Hang on a second here. It won't quite go full screen because Fun I make function, function F should give you a full. Well, I'm yeah, there, right. you there you go. Here we go. OK, this is quite short. And I'm going to pause it if I can at various points in here to to discuss. Um, anyway, this is a drawing um, made by my my new contraption. There's another one. I'm going to try and get that cursor bar to go away. Okay. There's the contraption itself, if you can see it. It, it consists of these three arms, which support these three pendulums. This pendulum swings this way in this plane. This pendulum swings in this plane, and this one is rotary. The rotary one has a platen up here with a piece of paper on it. There we go. Uh, and there, there's, I'm going to resume the video in a second, uh, and you'll see how it works, and then we'll come back to some of the deets. So there's the paper going around. Can you see that all okay? Yep. I deliberately did this low res to get through the zoom pipe. I get both arms going. I've got other ways of doing this now, but anyway. And uh, the string lifter lets the pen drop down on the paper. And now that the platen is going around in a circle and the two arms are driving the pen in an xy direction and the pendulums are all about the same length in this setup and here's what it's drawing this is not the same run but this is what it's drawing what it's drawing in this set in this mode and that's what the pendulums look like they're all pretty much in sync but i can raise them up and down because those are threaded arms and you can see all the turned parts in here which we're going to come to in a minute Okay, 
it never seems to make the same thing twice, or at least I can't make it. It's much more like a musical instrument to you get a little something different every time. <clears throat> Here's some of the parts. Um, these are before I cleaned them up a bit. Can you still see me or did I go away? You're good. The parts are there. Okay. Uh, these are the three gimbals, or the three hubs. I decided to make hubs that had pendulums below and then arms above for the apparatus. Now, these are stop collars, and these are two of the gimbals. Um, and here's an example of threaded rod, and I'm using cane parts, cane hardware, to join all these bits together. These here are washers that are bored on board for steel screws uh, to make uh, fulcrums. And then the points of the screws rest in dimples in mating washer surfaces that we'll see in a second. Here's a close-up of these parts when they were underway being made. The hardest thing I found in my little shop was to accurately bore these steel washers. And I finally found that if I bought Bosch bits, I could get more than one hole drilled at a time without breaking the bit. Uh, and I got and I made a jig that would hold them and index off the first hole and then drill so I could go around and do it. And I recessed them and set all this stuff together with epoxy. Um, and one of the uh, difficulties in the system is when you set these things, these fittings, which are cane hardware, you can't really control that that's perfectly true just by pushing it into the epoxy, no matter how true you machine it. Um, you really have to have a long rod screwed in there and be sighting that against a vertical to make sure that it's really correctly aligned before the epoxy sets, which I learned too late, of course. Uh, these are the threading tools I've been using. Um, these are, I have two of these taps that work. I have a larger one that I've been, I've taken apart that I can't sharp, quite sharpen accurately. I find it important to have test bores of the holes and test threads and to know exactly the right size to make the dowels and the bores. Uh, and it's really pretty critical to be dead on your dimensions with this. Uh, so these are, these are taps. Here's a, here's the smaller tap. And I write the dimensions that are needed for dowels and holes and taps right on the die on the, on the wood. So it's all right there. Um, and these work very well. Here's a close up of a walnut threaded rod. This uh, was well, around a half an inch started out. Um, I, I was testing a new close up lens I got for my iPhone, but i uh, it's as much, it's cut and also burnished. These threading tools have an aluminum throat that kind of burnishes the wood as it goes through. And that's all right, it makes a good hard finish. Uh, sometimes I run CA glue onto it, but I usually find that not necessary. Here's an example of some of the apparatus uh, looking closer up. Uh, this is the pendulum rod over here on the right. Can you see the cursor moving up and down all right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is a stop collar that allows me to change the height on it. And then this is a free turning collar here that uh, fits freely on the on the walnut rod. So it can it, it can rotate easily. It has two holes in the sides that these two threaded bits and this one over here thread into so it can rock up. And so this this larger collar carrying this pen arm can rock up and down. So this, that gives this thing three, you can rock up and down and it can pivot sideways with very low friction. Uh, this other apparatus over on the left is a cam that acts as a, one of several different pen lifters that I've devised. Um, so this allows me to lift the pen and put it down again and get the pendulums going and drop the pen where I want it to. Uh, here's a, here's a, the uh, the simpler one on the uh, variable pendulum, the with well, the Y, what I call the Y pendulum. Um, so that's that's that one. The other one has also uh, a, a counterweight to control the how much weight the pen puts on the paper. This is what my colleague, uh, partner in crime on this, Lawrence Souter. Lawrence is a retired professor in Philadelphia. We've been friends for years. Uh, we made this, this is a close-up look at the details of his contraption, which we made in my shop seven years ago, way before the pandemic. I don't remember if we devised this or if he figured it out later. I'm, I'm happy to credit him with figuring it out later. All that turned apparatus with wooden threads that I just showed you a minute ago is replaced by two nails and a ball-bearing uh, magnet. 
<laughs> so this is the equivalent pendulum on the other machine. There's a nail head there and a nail head in this rod that goes to the pin. And in there is a, looks like about a three eighths inch hemispherically magnetized high, exactly the kind of magnets I play with all the time. And that serves the very, very same extremely low friction three dimensional motion of the complicated gimbal I showed you a minute ago. So there's a, there's a vote for clever magnet, magnetic uh, momentums. Um, and then here's a little run of the drawings this thing makes uh, in its current mode. And I just love these. These are, I just think they're gorgeous. <laughs> and that's the signature line of a copy our video. So now I'm back and I'll see if I can get my, uh, my background back. And then I, if you bow if you'll kill the, uh, get, let me get back to a gallery view over here. Try to get my cursor. Yeah, I, I had spotlight you. I killed it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Use virtual background. I get my background back up and here we are. Comments and questions. Yeah, those pictures remind me of like birds flying that you see every once in a while. Yeah, it, it's the same motions, I think. Uh, mathematically, they would be listed juice figures, but the apparatus is sufficiently wonky to nothing ever quite comes out the same way. You know, and there's motion in it that, it that if it was a perfect apparatus, it would be like an oscilloscope drawing, like we used to see in electronics class. And I've seen a lot of software that'll draw that stuff on your screen. But I, I, I'm not after that. I'm after the wonkiness. And, I, you know, I, a lot, some of those drawings are made by adding energy to the pendulum is the way a clock escapement does. And so you're really playing it like an instrument. It makes me think of a theremin. And I think of the proper video really ought to have some music with it. Because uh, this is by setting the lengths of the pendulums, you're really beating frequencies into each other. And it's a visual analog of, uh, of music. Yeah, John, I see a uh, I see a laser involved instead of a pen, or a little drip from a, a paint reservoir of some sort. So as it drips on on a board, you could sell them. Okay. Yep, I think that's right. I think there's a couple of a lot of things you could do like that. Yeah, you could also use a laser on photographic paper. Um, I'm working on copy paper right now while I try and learn how it, what it does. Um, next, I'm going to go to uh, glossy photo paper just to see what I can do with markers. And also, you, by varying the weight of the pen, you can make it skip so it makes dotted lines. Maybe you could have it write music by putting rollers on each side and they could roll <laughs> through as, as it does it. By the way, I have a picture of you I want to show. I think it's pretty nice. This shows John's uh, great fun with it. So. I, I was there on his early. Um, yeah, it was in the when I just was first getting it set up. And and also because we couldn't see much of the drawing on the exposure was pretty hot in the other video. You can see a little more here what it does. So, yeah, I just that was great fun. I happened to be in his shop one day and he was all thrilled with it. So, so. <laughs> well, this version of it now is, a, is the second one I made. It's a research version. Uh, it has all kinds, I've deliberately made it utterly adjustable and all parts replaceable. And I've been replacing parts and refining them. Uh, what I'm heading for is making a third one that uses what I learned here. And I think I can make it quite a bit smaller. Um, the other one that I made, Lawrence's, Lawrence's contraption, is a, in the form of a table. Mine is just clamped on platforms to a chimney because uh, I can arrange it where I want it that way. Um, we made a table for his and that was a, it was a pretty good three legged table design and I figured out how to place the legs so the pendulums don't hit them. <laughs> so it's, and it has to be stable because you, you sometimes the weight on the pendulum doesn't affect the period of it. It's the length to the center of mass from the fulcrum is what governs the period, but the weight governs how long it will keep on going. It gives, it has this momentum from of weight. So if you want it to go a long time, you add heavier weight, weightlifter weights. <laughs> a lot of little turnings in that. And it was astonishing to me that the single magnet and two nail heads replaced about 12 turnings. <laughs> Quite ingenious, John. 
I'm working off a little book. I didn't invent any of this. I got to tell you, I'm just, I'm working. There's a little book called Harmonograph that has uh, some pretty cryptic descriptions. So I'm, but I'm starting from that and working away from that. But I've always liked this kind of thing, I'm, this kind of contraption. I've made a bunch of things like this before. <laughs> John, I share your interest in that. And what I've done in the past is used a speaker cone as a driver to vary uh, uh, a length, if you will. Uh, does that make any sense to you? Uh, especially yeah. if you even have an equalizer and can pick out the low bass and the high treble, uh, you, can, you can get kind of crazy. But that's that's beautiful, John. My son's a musician and he has a theremin or a, you know, yeah, a theremin, I think it is. We, you wave your hands around it makes tunes. So I'm going to try and get him and his theremin together with this thing sometime this year. <laughs> we'll see what we get. <laughs> it's hard to make a video of it. Uh, I've, I've shot a lot of it. It's very hard to get a video that's coherent. All right, that's me today, I think. Yeah. Who's next? I'm going to start out from the corner of the screen. I'm going to start with Jeffrey Carroll. I haven't heard from Jeffrey Carroll in quite a while. Thank you all for indulging my passion there. Jeff, what do you, what do you, what would you like to show us today? You're muted. Let me get off mute. I um, had made a footstool. Nice. 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 That's a beautiful piece. Can I see the turnings again, please? I really you like how you have to spotlight them, John. I just did. Yeah. I really like how meaty those are. Uh, that, that they're they're really bold shapes. Good stuff. Is that your first stool? It is. I was, in an antique, I was in an antique store and saw one. I took a picture of it and I said, I believe I could turn that. <laughs> so I came home and started turning. But what glue did you use? What glue? Yep. Type of. Well, the top is wedged. Um, okay. Wedges wedges in the top um that's just a we took a reamer and just made the hole drilled a small hole and reamed it out and then turned the legs to uh fit that these joints are tight bond that looks like it'll stay and that's your chucking recess in the bottom of the seat right right yeah it's only a 16th of an inch I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Where, where's your signature under there? I haven't put it on yet. Um, just finished it yesterday. So very good stuff. Any questions for Jeff? Stools are deceptive. Besides the seat, there's seven turnings in that. I think. Uh, eight. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I'm gonna take the spotlight off you. Go to the, go to the next guy, Ken Vasco. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know how it is when we buy tools. We always buy the tool, and then we try to figure out what project we should do to uh, use the tool. Well, <clears throat> I went ahead and bought uh, the Easy Wood coving tool. I don't I don't have any coving tools, or I'm sorry, beading tools. So I went ahead and bought it, and then I said, okay, what am I going to do with this thing? So <clears throat> I like to watch Richard Raffer, and I and I noticed he made some of those pots. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with his pots, but he, he gets, he uh, does a pot, end grain turning, very green, and then he usually puts it in the microwave, and it has a funny twist to it. So I gave that a try, and here's the what I came up with. And it did do, I put it in the microwave, but I did have a little bit of a split, but I think it's gonna stop there. This is apple wood. I know apple's not the best thing to do, but you can see how it got oblong. 
I think that's absolutely charming. Turn it upside. Yeah, I like that a lot. It's a, it's a dry weed pod. It's a pencil pod. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah, it really worked out nice. I think the hardest thing to do is get a tool long enough to get down into the bottom of that. Well, what, did, I, what, did uh, you do? what did you do about that? And how far down did you go? Well, it's all the way down to this level. So that's a good six inches down. But <clears throat> what I had to do is first I went and uh, tried using the Forsner bit and I got a small Forsner bit with a short extension, but that got kind of a little bit hairy. So I just used some scrapers, my scrapers best I could. And it's not real thick. So this was actually longer. This was about another three inches longer, but I couldn't get it any deeper. So I just stopped at this level. But it's it's really nice. It's really out of out of shape. It's not round. It has some lumps and bumps. It's really a, a great piece. I'm I really love it. I, I I see why I agree with you. It's a, 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 a very charming. Thank you. You know, that you know, splits a, uh, that splits a feature. Ken, you could charge extra for that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I don't know if you can I, see the inside, but there's a a flaw on the inside, and it just stops right there at the end of the split. So I don't think it's going to split anymore. But the microwave then, was the yeah. trick. Can you know what your next your next tool is? It's a D-way beating tool. I started with that and I hated it. So I went to the D-way and I love it. So the oh, yeah? Tool. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll take a look at it. But that was really you know, intriguing. I did, did you a workshop tell us with, with Richard Rapp and where we made those. And uh, his favorite beating tool for doing those was um, a 3 8 spindle gouge. Yep, and, I've you seen do, that. And, you, and you do the rotation, you get your hand and kind of go round and round and round and round all the way down the stick. And it was a blast. It was a real blast. It was fun. Yeah, I he actually I actually uh, on his video that he did these, I sent him a message that I tried one and I had a little trouble. And he sent me an email. And uh, <laughs> yeah, he sent me an email. And uh, so I sent him some pictures back. I haven't got I just sent a to it, but I haven't got any response yet. But I thought that was awfully nice of them to even give me an email about it. Now you said you microwave dry that thing. Yes. What, uh, what's what I use? Yeah. Well, I've I've microwaved in the past, and I usually do it thirty sec thirty seconds on, and then about a half an hour off. Thirty seconds on, half an hour. He recommended just putting it in for two minutes. And that's what I did and come out in two minutes and it's pretty thin. I don't know if you can see the walls, but it's fairly thin, eighth inch. And with the bead, it probably goes down to a 16th. So <clears throat> I, I did it for the two minutes and I stopped and it was done. So it was hot, but it was done. Did you bag, did you bag it in the microwave or just plain? <clears throat> nope. No, I did not. Halfway through, I took it and I turned it this way, put it in this way and I turned it this way. So the bottom, <clears throat> would get done. <clears throat> Excuse me. The bottom didn't split. Where was the pith on that? Where's the pith of the? Is it in the piece? Yeah, the the pith. I don't know if you can see it. Was right here. Okay, that's where you're. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's the bottom. Probably Put a little embellishment on the bottom. It'll, it'll probably survive. Yeah. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah, I think it will. <laughs> Terrific. Sorry. What I'm uh, trying to do Ken, the... Ken, I noticed you made yours into a box. I was thinking his were hollowed all the way through. And if so, you could hollow halfway and then turn it around and do hollowing from the other end. Uh, his were actually pots. They had a bottom on them. He called no, them I pencil don't... pots or... Or I guess spatula, I'm thinking spatula. I'm thinking of his of his tubes, whatever he calls those tubes. Yeah, yeah, he called this a pencil pot or a spatula pot. Okay. When we uh, when I did the workshop with him, we made tubes that were about 14 inches long, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a bottom in them, and we had to use an extension, uh, uh, a three piece extension on the Forstner bit, and you wow. only drill a half an inch and pull it all the way out and clean the bit and go in a half an inch, pull the bit all the way out. One of the people that were doing it uh, went in about an inch 
and it destroyed his piece because the wood swells when it comes off because this is green wood it was a blast we learned so much and had so much fun richard's excellent instructor on stuff like that we had a blast but that was the dip most difficult part once you got in so far it started to dry and move so you really couldn't sand it all that well <clears throat> so i had to sand it in a wet state so it was just it was a little bit different but it, it worked out okay for me i would yeah. be inclined to pour from both ends and then plug one end but that's <laughs> Yeah, and I had a thought about your crack. What if you purposely made a very thin slice, a cut all the way through, but about halfway down, and then let it look like a curl on the top, but gradually go into the round, perfectly uh, un uncracked part on the bottom, if that makes any sense? <clears throat> yeah, it does make sense. I can see, like, <clears throat> actually, there's a real nice feature that runs right through there. And I didn't want to disrupt it. So just because of the, the colors of the uh, apple, I haven't put any finish on it yet. And I'm not sure I'm going to. I'd take Carl, that as that an opportunity be, to make another. That, that would be uh, a I think, zipper putt. A zipper putt. Uh, that's true. I think I will make another. I've got a lot of apple up there. Uh, the local fruit farm, Way Fruit Farm, uh just got a bunch of trees and you can get a truckload for fifteen dollars. <laughs> That's uh anybody who lives near an orchard, apple is lots of fun to turn, but it does move around a bunch. But that's uh the the wood is quite hard. It's not as hard as pear, but it's really quite hard. And it does not does not have pronounced uh, grain, but it often has really good color and figure. Am I reading that right? Yeah, I believe so. It's been about uh, three weeks, and the pieces that are up there, I I put the uh, coating on the ends, but it, they haven't split all that much. I'm really surprised. I don't know whether it's going to take a little while or, but uh, it's it not makes a as, It's not as bad as people say. It is. I mean, it has a worse reputation than it actually is, in my experience. Uh, but I found it's always better to leave it in log form as long as you can and then cut the piece out that you want to turn when you want to turn it. So is it better to do green turning with it or let it dry and then turn? Well, you end up doing both because you can't turn it all in time. <laughs> green is on so much fun, but uh, it's really good wood to turn dry too because it'll turn to a high polish. Okay. Thanks very much, Ken. Good show. Um, I'm uh, Mark Skinner. Haven't seen from you in a long time. Got the spotlight on you. What are you going to show us? Hello, all. Hi. Uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, get a screen share up here. Okay. Mark's in Cumberland, Maryland. So uh, I started, I made a half a dozen tray tables uh, out of some cherry that I cut up on the hill here. Uh, see if I can. How did you convert that for planks? What did you do? Um, well, I, there's a chap here uh, who has a band mill. So I had uh, the logs sawn by him. And then I have a, a planer and jointer and so on. Nice. Uh, Okay, not now, Lila. Have a dog here too. Uh, so the only turnings in it were the the spreaders for the legs. You can see here, uh, you know, just the uh, the tenons on the end of those, and the, turning the the top spreader around so it'll slide. Uh, interestingly, here uh, they're the same length, <clears throat> but the uh, the iPhone really kind of distorts the length if you're not shooting straight down, which I thought was interesting. Another view of the table. Oh, uh, nice. I also, also made uh, a lidded box for a friend, uh, which I inlaid with uh, man-made opal. 
a couple of pictures of the opal. Um, so you can see the fire in it. Is that, it, that goes in as a, in an epoxy bed? Is that how that works? No, it's acrylic. <clears throat> it's a, a UV hardening acrylic. It's really nice stuff to work with. Uh, viscosity is pretty high, so it doesn't go all over the place. And you hold it, take it out in the sunshine for about two minutes and put it back on the lathe and finish it. So it's almost instantly in UV. So do you have to mix that up or does it come as a, you know, black bottle or what? Yeah, it comes in a black bottle, yeah. Um, you get it, I got it from Easy Inlay. Easyinlay.com. What's the name of it again? Um, well, give me a couple minutes. I'll run downstairs and get the bottle and, and show it. Okay, you can go back on when you find that when you do that. Yeah. 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 Any more slides? No, that's it. So we can kill the share now. Okay. That's that. Yeah. We kill the spotlight too. Any questions and comments for Mark? Very nice. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've made a number of the uh, lidded boxes and they seem to be pretty popular gifts. So the tray tables fold up, is that what they do? Yes. And uh, you made six? Yep. For your house or for one of your kids or? Uh, well, I'm keeping one here. Heather took one and the other four will go to Maine. Yeah. Nice. Um, you want to hang on a sec. Uh, well, you, you can come back on. We'll go to somebody else. We'll come back to you when you show up again. Yeah, okay. Very good. Okay, good. Okay. Um, John Ziegler. Okay. Uh, thanks. I uh, <clears throat> I don't think I showed this before. After we went to, uh, after Tom and I went to Johnny Keplinger's place and got all that wood, we came back with a bunch, like we talked last week. Uh, and I got a, uh, I took a, I'd never turned a crotch piece. Uh, this is walnut. I'm going to share my screen and hope that this works. Can you all see that? Yeah, now we can. Okay. So I'm not going to bore you, but this is what I started out with. You can see where I had already cut it, but that's what it looked like. That's when so I you, split it open. You cut it off the pith, in other words. Yes, you I did. Cut through the pith, you cut off the pith to one side. I cut off the pith, but I turned the piece that had the pith in it, and uh, you'll see what transpires. I'll just fly through these. I don't mean to be boring. Oh, no, 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 it's still there. I, I'm, just, I'm interested in how you were turning a lot of air there. How, did, how was that for you? I don't think you've done a lot of that. I've not done a lot of that. I've turned a few natural edge bowls, but not a crotch piece, which has a lot more. And again, I, I turned a circumference bigger than the piece itself or close to bigger. It wasn't contained within the crotch piece. I had not done that. It took me a little while, but I took my time. I sharpened the tools several times to make sure I had a good edge. And I just worked my way through it. Uh, I did turn in addition to the tenon, but I'll call it the second foot. So I had something to work with. It's a darn good thing I did because when I got done at the very bottom of this, um, I think it's probably paper thin because I didn't have a way to measure how close I was getting when I trimmed the bottom up. So, I did get quite a bit of tear out. This is way after I reversed it. This is what I was looking at. And it was really just a challenge to turn it because of all the bark. So finally, I, I peeled all the bark off because I knew I wasn't going to save any of it. And it started to show up like this and it got pretty punky. Um, now, did you do anything with that, like uh, any hardener or epoxy or? or well, I put epoxy. I put epoxy in, but by the time it got done, there wasn't much of it left. So you can see, it got more refined. Nice shape. Yeah, it's kind of weird, right? A little asymmetrical, uh, just because of the the configuration, and then that. That's the finished inside. That's the bottom. That's a nice piece. And then it's beautiful. That's the. Uh, Did you microwave dry that or anything, or is that just been sitting around? No, I didn't microwave it. It. So let's see. We cut it 
I guess we cut it on a, was it a Monday or I think it was a Monday, whatever. And I turned it on a Friday. This is the actual, this is the piece. So it's not huge. But it's not dry yet, I don't think. It's not quite dry, no. I don't know what, I don't know what the moisture content is. And then here's the bottom. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great adventure that one that's a really nice piece yeah it was fun like i said when i turned the bottom uh i could tell that i was getting really close to going through because obviously the sound it just gets to be so tinty for lack of a better word and when i felt it after i took it off <laughs> off the jam shot it um i could actually compress it slightly and feel it moving from both sides <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so I finished it with um, Odie's oil and let it sit for a day. And then I buffed it uh, on the Beale system. Is that black finger related to that piece, John? Uh, no, that black finger is from a scissors accident. <laughs> running with scissors at your age? <laughs> I actually wasn't even I wasn't even running. I was just opening up a box and the thing caught on it and my finger didn't and it slid up the it slid up the blade. <laughs> so I'm okay at the lathe. I just can't use scissors. <laughs> I think I'm okay at the lathe. No, no mishaps yet. As soon as I say that, watch what happens. Yeah. So no, that's what that's good. what I have. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Hello, Bert. I'm going to say no. you so last week we were, uh, I was talking that we had uh, the uh, group from uh, Seattle um, wanted to do some wig stands. So I'm going to do a share screen here. So we did a Zoom meeting and uh, and I posted the Zoom meeting. Can you guys see that? There's a pair of wig yeah. stands on my bench. Well, the one on the right was the one we uh, did during the uh, the demonstration we had about uh, I don't know seven or eight people on board with a couple from Seattle, and that took about forty five minutes to forty to fifty or forty five to fifty minutes to go from start to finish, while we were discussing it. And um, Amy had made a comment that that she was amazed that you know forty five minutes and there was a finished wig stand because they were trying to figure out a process where they could make theirs a little quicker. Apparently, it was taking them a while. So the next one on the on the left there, I thought, well, I had an extra set of blanks. So yesterday I went out and I thought, well, I'm just going to time myself. I'm not going to rush. I'm just going to make a wig stand one off and see how long it took. And it took 35 minutes start to finish. And uh, if I'd have had a whole bunch of blanks ready to go, I could have probably made uh, probably four wig stands in an hour. Because if you do each step on multiple pieces, and that's what they were looking for was trying to figure out a process for making them. So like well, we, I, we um, recorded the Zoom session and, uh, and they were happy with it because they uh, they got some pointers and they're going to see how they make out. So well, that, was, that was fun. That was we did that on Saturday. And then after I was done with my wig stand, whoops, what happened there? That was, wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, let's get back out of here. There. After I got done with the wig stand, I was playing with these ducks with feathers, and I finally figured out how to do it. So yesterday afternoon, I went nuts, and I made a whole bunch of them. So now I've got my process down where I can successfully recover when I blow the feathers off. <clears throat> I've got a method of uh, 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 design opportunity. Some of these bodies are a little bigger than the feathers, but that's okay, because everybody that sees them loves them. They're just uh, little offset ducks with feathers. Now, what are the magnets are sitting in them? <clears throat> They're uh, for uh, needle and uh, pin holders. So there's a right. uh, a little magnet in the in the behind the head, little offset, and then in the bottom, I put a magnet in the bottom as well. So if, the, if these are like for people that are doing cross stitch, where they have you know just through uh, two or three ne different needles with different threads, they can put them on. But if they drop one, they can grab the hat or the head, and there's a magnet on the base of the underneath, and they can pick it up off the floor or off the couch or wherever. Uh, so it's just whimsical how big tool. How, how big are these, Bert? Uh, they're about two inches in diameter and about uh, anywhere from uh, two and a half to three inches tall. Okay, that's a little smaller than I was thinking from looking at them. Yeah, that's what yeah, I should have put a ruler on it to make them. Uh, but it, they're the I started with a blank that was nominally uh, 
two, two, two and a half inch, <clears throat> just scraps, whatever I had available. And that's it. Great project. Hey, Bert, hey Bert on your wig stands. Yeah, uh, I watched your video. It was great, by the way. Uh, well, on your you. wig stands, how tall do you usually make them? I know there are different sized wigs, but is there a minimum and a maximum, do you think? Uh, well, one of the uh, our our group that we donate these to, they suggest anywhere from uh, 14 to 16 inches is is typical. Um, they they'll take them shorter and they'll take them. Well, they actually asked me to make some that were 24 inches because they had a couple of uh, really long-haired wigs and they needed some that were 24 inches long. So I made made them a couple with a 24 inch <clears throat> 24 inch spindle in the middle. But they said they don't use very many of the long ones, but uh, 14 to 16 inches and anything, you know, at 12, 12 to 24 inches, I guess, whatever your material you got works. At least with our, uh, our group, our cancer group, they're, they'll take as many as we can make. They they say they're like, I think we've given them over 100 already, and they'll take as many as we can make. And the diameters, what diameters are you using? I use nominal six inch for the base uh, and five inches for the top, nominal. These ones are two different sizes because that's just the wood that I had. Even a five inch base is more than stable enough to uh, sit on a table because the wig doesn't weigh very much. And I use uh, six quarter or eight quarter uh, material if I can. If I have to, I'll glue two pieces together to get at least six quarter. So it's got a little weight on the bottom but, and they're hollow. The top end is hollowed out. And uh, yeah, it was uh, a then, fun project. Uh, the base piece has a is a tray for earrings and stuff. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, this is hollow. This is hollowed out around the shaft here, so it's got a place for bobby pins and earrings and rings or whatever. And then the top piece is hollowed out more for uh, weight, but actually I hollow it out more because that's how I ha that's how I hold it to turn the outside. So we turn a cove on the inside of the top, and then put a recess in the cove. I learned that from Richard Rappin. Uh, when we're doing boxes and you can expand into that little recess. And when you look at it, it looks like a design feature because they shape it a little bit like a bead. And then you've got full access to make the top really nice and smooth. Hey, I and, have it's a, quick, and it's quick. I have a picture of how Richard Raffin figures out the, the uh, radius at the top. Yeah. Can you, uh, can you zoom in on that? Uh, the radius on the top you're talking here? Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I I don't worry about Ken, the actual Ken's showing radius. a picture, Bert. What's that? Ken's showing a picture of uh, wrapping with a piece of paper behind his head. Oh, uh, I see. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. I've yeah. seen that video too. I I had to yeah. laugh when I seen that one as well because uh, uh, <laughs> I had to take. That's exactly how you do it. It's uh, you know, like everybody's head is different, so you you just kind of you just get a feel for it. I I used to worry about it. I don't anymore. If I've no, got a six inch, yeah, you yeah. just make them until it feels good and nice and smooth and uh, and then call it good. Yeah, I had to get a screenshot of that. <laughs> that yeah. was very good. <laughs> hey, Bert, does That's the shape it. of that curve matter much? No, actually, it doesn't. Uh, as long as it's uh, you kind of look uh, uh, flatter on the top. I mean, take a look at your, uh, you know, feel your own head. It's kind of flat on the top and rounded on the sides a little bit. And it's a wig, so the the wig, as long as the wig isn't, um, you know, it's being stretched out, it's got to be small enough that it can fit on there and kind of hang naturally as it's drying. Because if they wash their wig and then they hang it on here, they, it's like a hat. If you if you wet a hat and put the hat on it, it'll sag if it doesn't have some support. But it's not. <clears throat> I've been told it's not critical, but it should have a a, a form so that it doesn't um, distort the hat. Yeah, it's, uh, I've always understood it that way as well. Yeah. Any any more on wig stands and Bert and questions for Bert? Yeah, Bert, I'd like to ask how you've got the uh, ribbon insignia. It looks laser burnt. Would that be true? That's correct. I've got a, a laser pecker pro. It, uh, it'll do. Uh, uh, it'll take pictures. I got uh, some line art off of the internet and. I just saved one of the images now, and then uh, every one of these I send, I just laser burn the uh, the ribbon on there, and it's a nice touch. People really really like it, right? It's one of those little little things you can do that adds some pizzazz and doesn't take very long. Very very nice work. Uh, thanks very much, Bert. Uh, you guys have posted a video, right? You, and I think you sent me a link, or I'm, I'm I lose track sometimes. 
Uh, I'm not sure if I sent you the link on this one, but I did make a video and it's uh, it's on my channel. So if you look up Bert Delisle on YouTube or wig stands, it should show up on a search. I'll try and get it in the follow up email. Uh, okay, Mark, you're going to, did you have the bottle there? And then I'm going to give the floor to Bowman. I do. Yes. <clears throat> so. Solar. Is, uh, yeah. Huh. All well, right. A bit of it goes a very long ways. I'm, I'm still on bottle number one after a year and a half or so of making these things. Interesting yeah. stuff. That's like the stuff that dentists use. They cure it with a, a squirt of light of the right frequency. Yeah. And let me see if I can show you the rest of the tray tables. Sort of. They're piled up over here. Mm. Uh huh. So is that your own design or did you have the design from somewhere? Um, I just, well, I just uh, copied a commercial table. Uh, okay. I changed the dimensions somewhat, but it, it's you know, fairly standard stuff. Okay. You got a drawing? No, I didn't bother with a drawing. Okay. So we don't have a drawing? Just measured the, part, just measured the parts. So. Yeah. It, it wasn't complex. It wasn't complex enough to need a drawing, as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Thanks very much. Sure. Bowman. Jim Bowman. Yes. Anyway, you got the floor, my friend. I will. Last got, week I, boy, I you talked sure did. about getting ironwood. From uh, this is. I, uh, this is probably what you would call a research one. This is actually my test uh, before I dove into the the really big piece, which I'm giving to a friend. But it's uh, it's beautiful grain, and it's when you turn it or sand it, it smells like a porta potty when you go in and they don't have perfume in it. <laughs> it it kind of has a stink to it. <laughs> It it actually cuts well. I I was surprised, and it didn't dull, but it is very fractious. Is that a good word? Uh, along the grain, it will split real quick. I I turned a couple of these bowls with my bore, my core bit, and I I smashed a few, and I actually patched this one up after it broke. Um, so it's kind of neat. Um, Here's another look at it. This one is, I glued a piece together. I had some thin pieces and this was just a test one. But uh, it's interesting uh, wood. I'm gonna try and mess with it some more. Uh, but my real fun was Doug Reeser, he's not on today, I think he's working out in Ohio, uh, handed me, a, the other week, handed me a cherry blank, very dry cherry blank that had a lot of voids in it. He said, Jim, here's a challenge for you. Do you know what John said about it? <laughs> oh, that's a nice piece of firewood. <laughs> I did not say that. I did not yeah, say that. Yeah, you did. I no, think you, you did it, John. <laughs> I definitely did not. I th I actually admired that piece. I thought that came out really nice. And I, I usually yeah. don't, don't like these kind of pieces. Uh, I mean, well, personally, I know you got a lot, a lot of you guys use this plastic stuff epoxy and i kind of admire what you do but it's not not something i'm going to do so well, i'm hard to please that, with it this one i like and this uh this one had a, a journey of making it i thought i was uh, a pre a rough turn blank is very hard to pour epoxy without spending 150 dollars worth of epoxy as you're going to turn away so i'll show you this one for two reasons I made, I took some of my old blanks that I'll never make, old bowl blanks that I'll never make anything out of because they're so old. And I made a form for the outside and a form for the inside and sandwiched it together and poured the epoxy in it. It only took 16 ounces. Well, what I forgot, I went off on vacation and left it hard and when I came back, the blanks, the forms had soaked up some of the epoxy. So it was only halfway filled in the holes so i had to do some work on that but on the bottom of this picture is i got a little too aggressive hogging those forms off because i just want the forms gone 
and I switched to one of my tools I had made and it was, I was being a little too aggressive and it broke right out. I was using one of um, Todd Raines's tool mounts. The problem with this tool should have been buried way down the heat handle for the way I was using it. So I learned, I reached for the one, I reached for uh, Jimmy Clue's mate. That baby's tough and it will take care of uh, any aggressiveness you do. Um, I think I that's to... your, I think that's your best bet for those kind of epoxy things. I mean, uh, if yeah. you want to cast, is just to make a form. That's what they would do in any professional casting I've seen. They would make a close fitting form and not waste a lot of material and cast exactly what you want and move on. I think one of the guys in the Langster Club, uh, Henry Fisher, he uses bowls from uh, cheapo bowls from Amazon. Yep. I didn't happen to have one around, and so I just made a form. But I thought I had sealed it with shellac, but that wasn't enough. It, it soaked in pretty good. But I this one pleased me. It was a, a bit of a burl, and it had voids that were... I got the mix right. Uh, it's actually three... This is a pour in the bottom. This is a pour. This is uh, the sealer epoxy that Wise Bond makes. Uh, the, these two holes, I uh, that stuff cures in no time flat. So I put some tape in the back and put it filled it with that. I got the color pretty close. It doesn't have the same swirly. And this is up here. I think was uh, CA glue that I put some blue powder in. Uh, John, I apologize for the blue. I just did it to make it stand off. I wish later maybe I'd have used red. Although this one, the color. Pretty I nice. think in this case the blue is very nice. It, it, it's cherry wood, I'm assuming, and it yeah, plays I, really it, nice together. It was definitely cherry, and I, I yeah. mark my stuff when I know it. I said Doug Cherry because I want to know where I got it from. This is my bottom. My brand got kind of buried in all the junk in the bottom there, but yeah, it was satisfying. I have a couple pours right now. I'm, I'm going to work on toward the end of the week, so. Well, I'm I'm enjoying the, I'm enjoying the adventures into color that you guys are doing. The, the, that red one that was showing up on your screen there, alongside those others, are pretty. Oh nice yeah, I thought, um, I, I, thought I, showed, I thought maybe I chose. I thought I did. Uh, yeah, the, other, the other thing uh, Toby might be interested in, I said, okay, what happens if I dye a chunk of wood and then bury it in epoxy? So I have one in curing right now. That's about a five inch diameter, about seven inches tall. That I dyed each side of it was a three or four sided uh, chunk of wood. I dyed each side and then I filled it with uh, almost transparent epoxy that had silver in it. And uh, I'm real anxious to turn it to see what happened to that dyed wood in the epoxy. So we'll see. A lot of encouragement from you guys is to stuff to try. So what can they say? So well, that's what we get here. We got a couple of minutes for our last word. If anybody has one, I I don't have a sermon here or anything like that. Oh, I do want to wish everyone a, a happy Easter or other religious holiday as as is appropriate to you as the calendar turns to spring. By the way, John, I did I did make a video uh, of me turning the full the full sized emergent emergent bowl, and uh, there's some surprises in it. So you I'll see your, when I get that edited. Oh, you got to edit that, yeah, yeah. Before you it's, can't just it's, the raw video. It's yeah. hours. It's hours of video right now. So yeah, hey, John? I've got lots of video of me looking for my ruler. Yeah. Uh, for those who are interested, the Susquehanna Woodturners will be meeting on April the 9th. The topic for the evening is sharpening. Uh, we will have probably a half a dozen different uh, sharpening stations and jigs available. Uh, so if you want to come out, to the Harrisburg Woodturners uh, and to Woodcraft, uh, bring your tools along. 
and we will uh, sharpen them. That was always a problem for me. Uh, many years ago, they right after Sorby came out with its Pro Edge, uh, Woodcraft and uh, had a rep come in and demonstrate it, and they said, "Bring your tools in, and we'll sharpen them." And I brought one of my skews in, and he looked at it, and he went, "Oh my!" <laughs> <laughs> I neglected along with that. The Nittany Valley Wood, the Nittany Valley Wood Turners will be meeting on April third. And I will be doing the demonstration, and it's going to be, let's see, rings, pendants, beads, and if we get time, maybe a bracelet. And All wood, no, no, no kits. I neglected to say that Mike Peace is doing the demo for the Lancaster Club meeting, and it'll be chess pieces. So making coherent multiples. So lots of turning adventures in all the clubs around the area, and uh, it's 11 o'clock, and I'm going to say goodbye to you all and see you all next week. Happy Easter to every one of you over Happy there. Happy Easter, and have a good weekend. Wood shop. Thank God for wood.